So our first paper is by Ron Arbisi from uh, the University of South Florida. He's a first year graduate student. So he is really trying to cut his teeth on trying to get a master's degree, right? <laughs> okay. So I'll turn the floor over to you for cohort colonialism in Iran and Chile. There's a famous story told of a conversation between Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai and U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger where in response to a question from Kissinger about the influence of the French Revolution on Western civilization, Zhou replied approximately, it is too early to tell. <laughs> Zhou's response clearly highlights the difference between actual long-term strategy and the short-term tactical expediency that characterized so much of U.S. policy during the periods of Cold War and formal decolonization and also suggests that many of the primary dynamics of both of these have yet to reach a state of terminal stability. Certainly, events such as the abrogation of the ABM Treaty, the maintenance of large nuclear arsenals, the doctrinal targeting of these weapons on cities, and the resumption of strategic bomber patrols suggest that while the ideological conflict may have eased, the fundamental great power conflict remains. Likewise, formal decolonization was also often illusory the newly independent nations immediately became both the prizes and the battlefields of the Cold War. The common interest of the Cold War adversaries in doing so, of course, was in the ability to fight each other without a high risk of the direct confrontation that might initiate a nuclear exchange. Thus, the preferred weapons of these conflicts were propaganda, subversion, sabotage, assassination, terrorism, and guerrilla warfare, many of which required plausible deniability to maintain the fiction that they were not acts of war requiring a military response. A common feature of the governments installed by these operations was their willingness to implement military and economic policies substantially similar to the policies of the former colonial regimes. In this way, then, the covert action apparatus developed to fight the Cold War became the primary apparatus of neocolonialism. Two examples of this are Iran, where the nationalist government of Mohammed Mossadegh was overthrown by a CIA-organized coup in 1953, and Chile, where another coup elevated the tyrannical but reliably anti-communist Augusto Pinochet to power. This is further reinforced by the observation that both of these operations, while tactical successes, were long-term catastrophes to the interests of all involved, including the U.S. One need not be either an historian or international relations specialist to recognize some of the more odious results of the Iranian operation. The Iranian Revolution of 1979, the war of nerves that has continued between Iran and the U.S. ever since are only the most obvious. The competing motivations of colonialism and Cold War strategy were revealed in the planning stages when British representatives first raised the possibility of a covert operation against Mossadegh in a secret meeting with CIA officials in 1952. Mossadegh had nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company, the major conduit of Iranian oil revenue to Britain, and the British government had responded by planning to remove Mossadegh by either covert or overt military action. The Truman administration refused to cooperate with either, however, and Mossadegh stopped a unilateral British effort in October 52 by expelling the British from Iraq. The incoming Eisenhower administration, however, had a more sympathetic view toward British designs, as sympathetic CIA officials had suggested it would. British intelligence, however, took no chances. MI6 liaison Christopher Woodhouse, when presenting the British case, stressed the Cold War argument, saying, quote, not wishing to be accused of using the Americans to pull British chestnuts out of the fire, I decided to emphasize the communist threat rather than the need to recover control of the oil industry, end quote. Even though the British, quote, regarded Iran as basically a conservative country that would not seek Soviet help or collapse internally, the emphasis of the communist threat harmonized strongly with the McCarthyism then sweeping Washington, as well as with Eisenhower's desire to control Iran's oil. As Eisenhower said, I am concerned primarily and almost solely in some scheme or plan that will keep that oil flowing westward. The operation was authorized and given the name TP Ajax. The question of whether the operation served more as an instrument of Cold War anti communism or great power neo colonialism can be answered by considering four relevant dynamics conditions in Iran as a British protectorate, the ideological predispositions of Mossadegh and his government, conditions in Iran subsequent to the coup, and overall effects of the operation on Iran and the United States. British policies of pre-coup Iran were plainly colonialist. The 1901 oil concession that had allowed the British exclusive access to Iran's oil gave only 16% of oil revenues to Iran, excluded Iranians from management and accounting. The actual figure was probably about half of that. 
provided cut rate fuel for the Royal Navy and used Iranian oil to finance exploration in other parts of the world without sharing profits. Inside Iran, Iranian laborers and the surrounding communities rarely enjoyed improved wages or living conditions, and British refusal to train Iranians hobbled the ability of Iran to manage and operate the company without them. Renegotiation of the oil concession in 1933 had frustrated the Iranian view that, quote, control of oil was a core component of Iranian sovereignty, end quote. A bridge sovereignty, economic deprivation, and resource expropriation under the threat of force clearly make protectorate a euphemism for colony. The Cold War rationale for the coup also depends for its validity upon whether the Mossadegh government constituted a communist threat. The 1998 CIA history of the operation states, even the most bitter anti-Mossadegh partisans did not claim the Iranian prime minister was a communist or a sympathizer. State Department, Department analysts agreed, saying, most of them had no inclination whatsoever toward communists. This contrasts sharply with the 1954 CIA history of the event, which claims there was real danger of Iran falling behind the Iron Curtain. Far more likely is that most of it was a nationalist first, as suggested when he said we value independence more than economics, and as he said to U.S. Ambassador Henderson, you can tell them you were saving Iran from communism. The neo-colonial nature of the coup is also made clear by the derision, uh, the division of Iranian oil assets afterwards. 40% ownership held by British Petroleum, 14% by Royal Dutch Shell, 7% each by Gulf Oil, Soconi Mobil, SO, later Exxon, Standard Oil of California, and Texaco, 6% by the Compagnie Française de Petrole, and 5% by various interests collectively known as the Iracon Agency. And there is very little need to look further. A repressive one-party regime imposed by covert action dependent on a superpower for its existence and complicit in the looting of its own natural resources is a colonial regime in every practical sense. The threat of communism was marginal at best, and the overthrow of this regime by the people of Iran in 1979 had far less to do with Cold War bipolarity or Islamic extremism than with a people's desire and struggle to be free of foreign dominance. Although the ideological anti-communism of Richard Nixon is legendary, his it, it, ideological anti-communism was not significantly different from that promulgated under Eisenhower 20 years earlier and used essentially the same criteria. Client governments had to be stridently anti-communist, strong enough to deter attack, authoritarian enough to deter subversion, and repressive enough to deter covert action. The election in 1970 of Salvador Allende socialist as the president of Chile then represented a challenge to a basic U.S. Cold War strategic assumption of a secure U.S. position in the Americas, the exception of Fidel Castro and Augustine. Conditions in Chile prior to 1970 had been deteriorating for an extended period along a fairly predictable path, increasing oligarchic control of government supported by foreign domination of resources and created popular dissent. Reformers had been hamstrung by extremists on both sides. As a result, the Marxist movement had been born, other avenues of reform being closed off. Salvador Allende had run for president three times before his victory in 1970 and had only lost in 1964 because of massive covert intervention by the CIA. These operations continued between 64 and 69. Therefore, by 1970, the CIA had an extensive network of assets inside Chile, including politicians, media figures, military officers, and multinational business interests. The role of multinational corporations in the Chilean coup and the use of funding sources outside of public or congressional scrutiny represents a significant difference from the Iranian action. This would later become a standard practice as seen in the uh, Iran-Contra scandal and in the activities of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. Chile had had long-term arrangements with U.S.-based multinationals such as Anaconda Copper and International Telephone and Telegraph and John McCone, Director of Central Intelligence, during the 1964 operation that had defeated Allende, was a member of the board of ITT by 1970. While offers of direct ITT aid had been declined by the CIA in 1964, agency officials helped ITT make connection with private individuals who served as conduits for approximately $700,000, of which approximately half came from ITT. The ideological predispositions of the Allende government seem to fall somewhere between the revolutionary communism of Castro and the incidental socialism of Mossadegh. While a socialist, the perception of Allende as a radical in the Castro mold is belied by the description of the Allende game plan by Henry Kissinger in his summary memo to President Nixon of 5 November 1970. 
after excoriating Allende as, quote, a tough, dedicated Marxist, end quote, Kissinger then described the path he expected Allende to take. To avoid pressure, Allende will seek to be internationally respectable, move cautiously and pragmatically, avoid immediate confrontations with us, and move slowly in formalizing relations with Cuba and other socialist states. This does not in any sense support Kurt Kissinger's earlier characterization as suggests an ideological element. Allende was unacceptable, and therefore he needed to be removed, and Nixon so ordered on 15 November 1970, including in his instructions to Director of Central Intelligence Richard Holmes to make the Chilean economy scream. Again, details of the coup are almost irrelevant, just as, it, as Allende's mar martyrdom was assured whether he committed suicide during the coup, as reported, or whether he was killed. A long democratic tradition was undermined, and a civilian government replaced by a military junta headed by General Augusto Pinochet. It is impossible to describe conditions in Chile after 1973 without discussing, without discussing Pinochet. Economically, he immediately reversed the nationalization of the banks that had taken place under Allende, but his most lasting legacy would be political. As the Church Committee stated, following the September 11, 1973 coup, the military junta led by General Augusto Pinochet moved quickly to consolidate its newly acquired power. Political parties were banned, Congress was put in indefinite recess, press censorship was instituted, opponents of the new regime were jailed, and elections were put off indefinitely. CIA reports at least 1,600 civilians being killed in the first month following the coup. A State Department analyst noted, in the minds of the world at large, we are associated with this junta, ergo, with fascists and torturers. Chile is just the latest example for a lot of people in this country of the United States not living up to its values. It's not necessary to chart a complete record of the thousands of dead, tortured, and disappeared to get a sense of what the Pinochet regime was like. As Kissinger said, we don't also want to get into the position of explaining horror. However, the horror was not to be confined to Chile. It would reach throughout Latin America and even in the United States. This was done by an alliance of the intelligence agencies of Pinochet's Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia called Operation Condor, which shared information on leftists, potential enemies, and, quote, nearly anyone who opposed government policies, end quote, carried out assassinations all over the continent, conducted operations in Europe, and executed the car bomb assassination of former Chilean Ambassador Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C. A malignant but localized policy of anti-communist political expediency, ruthlessness, and contempt for democracy metastasized into a hemisphere-wide right-wing terrorist condition. If there was ever a clear indication that a policy has gone wrong, bombs going off in one's capital should be it. Yet the United States would fail to learn the lesson of Condor, would fail to grasp that promoting and funding extremism and covert violence in the pursuit of limited policy goals produces armies of covert extremists with agendas of their own and they would repeat the mistake on an even grander scale in Afghanistan during the 80s. Unanticipated consequences aside, the covert operation that destroyed Chilean democracy for a generation had all the tangible effects of a colonial conquest. Tyranny, resource exploitation, loss of civil liberties, and brutal repression of dissent. Further, it produced a well-funded transnational covert network of agents and assassins whose only allegiance was to authoritarian anti-communism and the credibility of the justifications for this is inversely proportional to the level of terror applied. The secrecy that masked these operations has also had odious effects by undermining confidence in the U.S. government by subverting the democratic process. As Morton Halperin, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, testified in the Church Committee's investigation of the Chilean operation, presidents choose covert operations precisely to avoid the bureaucratic and public debates that they come to despise. They want to do things quickly. They want to do things without debate. Covert operations provide a way to do that. The case against covert operations is really very simple. Such operations are incompatible with our democratic institutions, with congressional and public control over foreign policy decisions, with constitutional rights, and with the principles and ideals that this republic stands for in the world. All of these things were undertaken without the knowledge or consent of the Congress or of the public. The techniques we apply to others will inevitably be turned against the American people. Perhaps the most critical aspect for policymakers to consider when deciding to engage in covert operations is this. A successful operation does not guarantee a desirable outcome. 
and any short-term benefit is likely to be negated by the deleterious long-term effect upon the image, credibility, and institutions of the United States. While propaganda and intelligence collection activities can be compatible with U.S. ideals, the same cannot be said of assassinations, guerrilla wars, coups, terrorism, and death squads. And as Halperin warned, there would be a homecoming. The FBI's COINTEL Pro, which infiltrated and surveilled, among others, women's equality organizations, new left student groups, the Vietnam veterans against the war, black power groups, and the only American targeted by both the FBI and the KGB for active measures, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom like the village in Vietnam had to be destroyed in order to save it, and covert operations were the weapon of choice. The tragic irony of this contradiction is only exceeded by the difficulty one encounters when attempting to conceive of how a KGB operation, if it was intended to undermine and discredit the U.S. government, how could it could possibly have been more successful.